drink wine, my children. The classic Universal horror movies set the stage for the popular vision of these iconic monsters, including, of course, Dracula. Make no mistake, though, my children. This film takes many liberties with the source material, changing several aspects, adding its own memorable dialogue. It is an imperfect film, but a classic nonetheless, particularly thanks to its monstrous star, Bela Lugosi. But have you ever wanted to see Bela Lugosi in a more faithful adaptation of the novel? The definitive Dracula within the source material? Well, here's this comic to the rescue. Jonathan Harker, studying the details of his upcoming visit to Transylvania and Count Dracula, finds it odd that he can't seem to find the locality of the Count and his castle anywhere on the map. Still, he travels to the Bistritz, a well-known city, to stay the night before he heads off to the Borgo Pass. There, at the Golden Crown Hotel, he finds a letter from the Count and his shadow waiting for him, informing him that a coachman shall bring him the rest of the way. When asking the hotel owners about the Count, they make the sign of the cross and claim to know nothing. Still, the locals beg him not to leave. It is the eve of St. George's Day. When the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway. So, in other words, a rockin' party! Still, he is dedicated to his business dealings and must go to the Count, first dropped off at the Borgo Pass before being picked up by Dracula disguised as the coachman. On the path, they are stopped by mysterious blue flames, the howling of wolves increasing. The coachman goes to stand in the flames as the wolves converged and surrounded them, but the coachman controlled the wolves, sent them away. The children of the night off to make music elsewhere. On thus, at the castle, the coachman retreats, and Dracula greets. And there he is, Bela Lugosi, reciting the familiar lines of our beloved Count. He does not in his version say that Jonathan, no doubt, after his long journey, needs to refresh yourself by making your toilet. Odd that that line never seems to make it into these things. Still, a detail from the novel that is often overlooked but mentioned here, the Count has a rank, nauseating smell to his breath. You'd think someone with such pronounced teeth would take better care of them. While I cannot go detail by detail with everything they kept from the book, the Blue Flame's significance is explained on its connection to St. George's Eve, with many a line taken directly from the novel. And in fact, a line is added when he recounts the old times of warfare in Transylvania. He mentions the day of the Dracula blood were the leaders of the people who went to fight. This is still an adaptation after all, changes are bound to happen. But some things are universal, like Dracula climbing the outer walls of the castle like a lizard when Jonathan Harker forced to become a prisoner of the Count. And his wives, who visit Jonathan in the night before being shooed off by Dracula. But hey, he's a good husband. He brought dinner home for them. Mmm, baby back ribs. Later, Jonathan tries to scale the walls himself to make an escape, and indeed is successful in leaving his room only to find the Count in his coffin, eyes wide open even while asleep. Hell, in this comic version, he even attempts to slay the Count, but his hypnotic gaze keeps him from hitting his target. Soon, Jonathan makes his plans to escape the Count, while the vampire travels to England to take possession of Carfax Abbey. In England, Jonathan's fiancée Mina worries for her lost love, as his letters from Transylvania are so cold and lifeless. Still, she has reason for joy, as her friend, Lucy, has been courted by three men. Asylum Dr. John Seward, American cowboy Quincy Morris, and finally whom she chooses to accept, aristocrat Arthur Hornwood. But enough of romance, let us talk of dead things. Like the Demeter, the ship carrying Dracula and his belongings. With the ship arriving at port, crewed by corpses, the captain tied to the steering wheel. And when the dock workers investigate, a large wolf emerges from the Demeter's hold and runs off in the direction of the asylum Dr. Seward works. And indeed, once there, Dr. Seward recounts how a patient of his, Renfield, has taken to trapping flies, and even eating them. But now Renfield speaks of a master that promises things to him. And meanwhile, Lucy has a fourth 
wolf suitor coming to her, with a wolf-like gaze that draws her sleepwalking body close. Still, the other suitors are more than happy to celebrate Arthur's coming nuptials, discuss the Demeter situation, even how Seward thinks that Renfield might be an undeveloped homicidal maniac. Hey, it's the life of that rockin' party! Lucy, in her sleepwalking, soon is found by Mina being attacked by Dracula, though she thinks it was just her imagination. Though there are still the fang marks on poor Lucy's neck. Mina is summoned away from her friend as she gets word of Jonathan, ill and in the care of nuns in Budapest, where they are married, leaving the girl to suffer more attacks from the Count. With Lucy's health seeming to deteriorate, Dr. Seward has summoned his old colleague and teacher to assist. Dr. Abraham Van Helsing. Because of her blood loss, they give her a transfusion. You think a vampire notices if someone has had a blood transfusion, like the taste is different? On Van Helsing hangs garlic flowers on her window, which she later orders her maid to remove, allowing the Count to enter and... Well, become an anamorph, it seems. The next morning, Lucy has the fangs of the Nosferatu, as Van Helsing has feared, and her living body dies soon after. Mina and Jonathan return home upon hearing the news, Mina sharing journals with Dr. Van Helsing on believing that Dracula is responsible for Lucy's death. When news of a murdered child reaches the doctor, Van Helsing believes Lucy was responsible, proving it to Dr. Seward soon after. Van Helsing and the suitors confront the undead Lucy in her tomb, saving a child she had planned to feast on, and then, with a moment's courage, put a stake through her heart. Van Helsing recounts the lore of the vampire, that they are the undead that must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. But by destroying the body of the vampire, her true soul is set free to join the angels. Ah, I think she's better off with the undead! Of course, as one of the undead, I'm kind of biased. While our heroes make their plans to kill Dracula, Mina is kept safe at Dr. Seward's asylum, where she meets Renfield, who admits that he believed that he could prolong his life by consuming the living, no matter the scale of creation. But upon seeing her, he warns her of the danger being so close to the Count makes. Van Helsing has his warnings as he briefs the group on the Count's powers. The strength of twenty men, he can take the shape of a wolf, command the meaner things of the world to do his will, and even direct the elements like the storm, the fog, and the thunder. Still, he has limits. He cannot enter a home uninvited. He must return to the boxes of soil of his native homeland each night to restore his strength, and he sleeps during the day. Quincy wishes to go and deal with the vampire alone if need be, but they remind him that daylight is their weapon. Van Helsing has the group join in a compact. They are not without strength and have the power of faith on their side. And they will destroy Dracula. Renfield, knowing their task, asks to be freed, but they cannot risk it given his likely connection to the Count. Instead, our heroes enter Carfax Abbey, finding 29 of the 50 boxes of soil the Count brought. They sanctify the soil and sterilize the earth, but Dracula has other designs. Using Renfield to invite himself into the asylum, he enters as Mist and attacks Mina. While our heroes locate the other 21 boxes, Renfield confronts Dracula and is murdered by him. But he is able to tell Dr. Seward of Mina's attack. Unfortunately, they are too late to stop Mina from drinking the blood of the vampire, which will transform her into a being like him. Finding three other residences that Dracula had purchased, our heroes begin their quest to destroy them and the Count. Their only chance to save Mina from the vampirism. After destroying his boxes of earth, they confront him in battle, but he is able to escape, warning that his revenge is spread across centuries and time is on his side. With Mina connected to the Count through the vampirism, they hypnotize her to learn that the Count is traveling back home to Transylvania. Their attempts at stopping him at ports are thwarted, but fortunately Mina is able to suss out his route, the group splitting into smaller parties to try to intercept him. Mina and Dr. Van Helsing are besieged by Dracula's wives, but a sacred circle protects them long enough for the good doctor to slay them in their sleep. Our heroes manage to reach Dracula as his servants take him back to the castle, with some additional bits added to the comic wherein Van Helsing and Mina assist with some sniper shots from their overlook. 
but poor Quincy is still slain during the battle. However, as the sun sets, their task is not yet done. Taking inspiration, no doubt, from the Coppola film, as Dracula rises and attempts to slay Van Helsing, but instead Quincy impales the vampire and Jonathan slices off his head. Seven years later, the heroes regather at Castle Dracula to reflect on what has passed, and we learn that Jonathan and Mina's son is named Quincy in his honor. A great retelling of a classic, my children. And of course, the best part is that it once again has its most famous star to play the role. Ah <laughs>